Hello everyone. Recently I was thinking about making some videos concerning salvation. And I was thinking about, you know, what things I could talk about. And I was thinking about, you know, what an utter mess we have out there. There's a wide variety of claims, you know, concerning doctrines about salvation. So I was thinking about some passages which people often overlook or they twist or misconstrue. And I thought it would be interesting just to go on YouTube and see what some of the popular preachers of America had to say about some of these verses. And it was just unbelievable. I, when I say unbelievable, it, it's like I'm watching some strange portent. I, I can hardly believe that these guys are so blind to what is there, right there in front of their noses, but they don't see it. And, you know, I have to conclude the reason they don't see it is because it doesn't serve their doctrines. They only see what they desire to see. So I just typed in James 2.24. A man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Just to see, for interest's sake, what some of these guys had to say. And... It was pretty interesting. Uh, one, one example was John MacArthur. And so what he did to try and explain this verse was he went to Romans 4, where Paul says, you know, if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. Oh, that's it, but not before God. Abraham was being justified before men. So he started arguing this, even though when he offered up Isaac, nobody was there. <laughs> and then he, once he felt he had accomplished that, he wanted to try and argue that the word justification or justify in James chapter 2 wasn't referring to salvific justification. It really just meant vindication. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's utterly astonishing to watch this because at Romans 4, where Paul says this, he immediately says, I'll read it all. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. MacArthur's key words. But then he ignores the very next sentence. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. What verse did James quote? Do you remember? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, his faith was perfected or completed. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. James is obviously talking about being justified before God not men. In fact, he starts out this discussion in verses 11, 12, and 13, talking about being judged on judgment day. And then he says, what use is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? When? Judgment day, <laughs> when God judges all men through Christ. But he just ignores this to try to come up with this crazy concoction, you know, that he's got that Abraham was just being vindicated before men. Just a big fat lie. 
because the facts are right in front of his nose that that's not the case. But you can tell he doesn't care. Another one I was thinking about is where Jesus said, Go away from me. I never knew you. And so, you know, I typed in that verse, and I found a video um, where Paul Washer is talking about this. And he was getting into where Jesus said, you know, many, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father. And I noticed that Washer and a lot of other people, because I checked out a lot of other videos too, just to see, would go, well, what could Jesus have meant when he said, only those who do the will of the Father will enter the kingdom of heaven? And it's like they're resorting to their imagination, wondering what he could have possibly meant by that. And it, it was just crazy to watch all these videos, including washers, and them behaving this way, because Jesus tells you what he means right away. He tells you immediately what he means. He says, therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like the wise man who built him, built his house upon the rock. Jesus is wrapping up his Sermon on the Mount here. And this is the end of it. This is the concluding message he has to the Sermon on the Mount. These words of mine was everything he taught on the Sermon on the Mount. And the wise man is the one who does these words. These words that Jesus was teaching is the will of the Father that he's talking about at Matthew 7.21, where he says, only those who do the will of the Father will enter. John 7.16, Jesus says, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Jesus is teaching the Father's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. This is the will of the Father. Go back to Matthew 5, 1 and 2. Jesus began to teach them. And then at the end of chapter 7, the crowds were all amazed at his teaching. Why were they amazed? Same reason the Jews were amazed at John seven fifteen, And Jesus responds by saying, My teaching isn't mine, but his who sent me. And so to do the will of the Father is to do everything Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And not necessarily just the Sermon on the Mount. I think everybody recognizes that. He had other teachings as well. But Jesus explains himself right away. Guys like Paul Washer and everybody else I watch pretty much are going, what could he have meant by that in verse 21 when he said, only the will of my Father. And Jesus explains it right away and they completely ignore him. They don't hear him. Why? It's unbelievable to watch. Unbelievable. Another thing I've been thinking about um, quite a bit lately is how to explain salvation to people in the context of all this mess that exists, especially in Protestantism. You know, Catholicism, at least it's uniform. In Protestantism, you know, there's all these different ideas and all kinds of confusion. That's not to say the Catholics have it right either. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there's, there's a big mess of confusion out there. So I've been thinking, well, you know, how can I simplify this and show people, you know, how they're getting confused and, you know, make some videos on that subject. So, at this point, I've kind of narrowed it down to, you know, three big problems. One problem is, is that people confuse salvation events. For example, 
when someone brings up James 2.24, you'll always see someone go, no, we're saved by grace through faith. Ephesians 2.8. They're comparing apples and oranges. This is stupid to do this. James is speaking to people who have already been saved in that Ephesians 2.8 salvation event. That's why it's in the past tense in Greek. You have been saved. James is speaking to believers who have been saved in the Ephesians 2.8 salvation event, and he's telling them what they must do to be saved on the last day when Jesus comes again. And there's all sorts of passages that refer to that salvation event, not the same event, which is why Hebrews 9.28 says, believers are eagerly, eagerly awaiting Jesus' second coming to save them. So as far as that salvation event is concerned, they're not saved. That's why they're waiting to be saved. Hebrews 9.28. And there's other passages as well. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 to 10, etc. That salvation event hasn't occurred yet. And that's what James has in mind in James chapter 2. You know, so comparing this to Ephesians 2.8 is silly because the people he's speaking to, that's already happened to them. He's telling them what they must do to be saved on Judgment Day. That's the first major confusion out there. People just kind of muck these things together. They don't ever think about, well, what am I saved from? Or what was I saved from? What will I be saved from? What salvation event is this verse about? Just doesn't even occur to them. And they don't really care most of the time. A second thing is a misconstrued notion of faith. When the Bible uses the word believe, to believe in Jesus, or when the Bible uses the word faith. And people in practice... Almost every Protestant in practice will construe believing and faith to mean acknowledging things to be true. And when you confront them with that, they'll go, oh no, I don't believe that. You know, that's just mental assent. No, no, that's not enough. You know, faith just isn't mental assent. But in practice, that's what they do. And if you press them, okay, if it's not just mental assent, what else is it? They're going to have a very hard time answering you. Because they don't know. And they'll, and they'll try to get out of it by saying things like, well, it just can't be in your head. It's got to be in your heart. Oh. What does that mean? you got to be sentimental about it when you agree that these things are true? You see, James says even the demons believe and shudder. The demons confess straight to Jesus that he's the Son of God. The Christ. They said it right to them. They believe that. So, but oddly, people think that when they read, like when James or John says, you know, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, or whoever believes that Jesus is the Son of God, etc., has eternal life, or God abides in him, or whatever John says. They think all they got to do is believe that's true. And then they deny that their faith is simply mental assent. Well, in practice, that's what they do. But James explains what a complete faith is. And Paul would not disagree with him. A complete faith is one where you have works. It's not faith plus works. James says, I will show you my faith by my works. And then he explains that a person's faith is not a complete faith until it work, until a person does works. It's belief in the truth, faith alone, plus doing the response of works. 
So he's telling you that by definition, saving faith is believing in the truth, like the demons do, but that's not enough. It's believing in the truth plus doing good works. That's what saving faith is. It's not saving faith plus works. That's not what James is saying. He's saying you've got to believe in the truth, acknowledge it's true. Yeah, I agree with that. Well done. Even the demons believe in shudder. But saving faith includes doing works. And that's why he ends up by saying a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In other words, a man is justified by doing good works of love and not just by acknowledging Jesus is the Christ. God is one. Jesus is the Son of God. And there's all kinds of evidence in the scripture that explains that if you look. But in practice, people think it's just believing certain things are true. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ? Yes, I do. Well, then you're saved. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? You see, all that kind of stuff. And every preacher will have a different thing that you have to believe. And that's why many Christians run around talking about, well, do I have to believe this to be saved? Or if someone believes that, will they be damned? You see, it's all about believing which doctrines are true and which are not. They think that's what faith is. That's not what faith means in the Bible. Let me give you an illustration. You know that, that little trust exercise where someone stands behind you and you fall backwards and they're going to catch you? And if you don't fall over backwards, you're, you don't trust that they're going to catch you. Right? To, to illustrate that you fully trust them, you actually have to fall over. Faith is something you can see. That's why James says, I will show you my faith by my works, by what he does. When Jesus saw uh, the friends of the paralytic bringing them down in through the roof just to get to Jesus, it says Jesus saw their faith. What was he seeing? He was seeing these guys struggling and striving to get their friend to Jesus. It's something you can see. And that's why James is saying a man is justified by works. And faith is made complete when you do the works. Before you do the works, you have an incomplete, dead faith. Faith alone. Useless. It's not saving faith. And yet, this is the faith most Protestants are relying on. What James is actually saying in James 2.24 is you Protestants are wrong. In Protestantism, a man is not justified by works, but by faith alone. And what James is actually saying is you're wrong. A man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And his words mean the exact same thing as the words the Protestants are using when they say a man is not justified by works, but is justified by faith alone. It's really sad to see this. Faith. Pretend you're downtown somewhere and Jesus is standing right beside you. And Jesus says to you, I want you to see those men over there in the parking lot? Those ten guys over there? I want you to go over there right now and preach the gospel to them. Just a little warning. They're going to beat you to death when you do this. They're going to kill you. But don't worry. Don't worry. Have faith in me. He who loses his life for my sake will save it. I will raise you up on the last day. Don't worry. Now go. That's what faith in Christ means. You'll go. You'll go. And if you don't go, if you don't do that work, your faith is incomplete. It's dead. It's meaningless and useless. 
And that's why Jesus said, if you don't take up your cross and follow after me, you're not worthy of me. Whoever does not carry his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's what Jesus says. You see, true faith is your response. It's what you do. It's not just what you think. Salvation isn't a theology test. Our faith is what we do in response to God. It's the good works we do in response to Him. And that kind of brings up the, uh, the third problem that is out there. The first one was confusing two different salvation events. The second one is mis misconstruing what faith really is. And the third one is works. Getting really screwed up on works. There's a lot of, especially lay people out there, who just think, you know, when they see the word or the term, works of the law in the Bible, that means any works they do with their body. Feeding the poor, that's what works of law means. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the first mistake. Paul is talking about this because he's, he's trying to explain to Jews that the righteousness of God that you have in Christianity is something that we may have apart from works of the law. And he's explaining this to defend the idea that Gentiles don't have to come under the law because he's the apostle to the Gentiles. Works of the law and, you know, like works in general, loving your neighbor and doing this, it has, they're not the exact same thing. That's, that's one screwed up thing people do. Another one is that people suppose that the works Christians do are their own works. And so if they, they'll argue that if you think these works have anything to do with your salvation, you're relying on your own effort and all that. Well, the truth is, they're just betraying that they may not be a true Christian when they say that. Because the very point of Christianity is that you die to yourself. You deny yourself, crucify the flesh. There's all kinds of terminology in the Bible. Our works are works that come from us. That's why we die with Christ. So that we might do the good works of God. Ephesians 2.10. People don't seem to get past Ephesians 2.9. In Ephesians 2.8, yes, everybody agrees, including the Catholics, that we're saved by grace apart from works. You can't do anything to get God to respond to you. It's just a gift God already offers. Everybody agrees with that. That's not the question. Everybody agrees there's, there's no works of any kind that we do that have anything to do with receiving God's gift of grace, the Ephesians 2.8 event. The question is, now what? That's the question, real question. What about Judgment Day and being saved from the wrath of God on Judgment Day? What do I have to be do to be saved on that day? You see how people are confusing Ephesians 2.8 with being saved on Judgment Day. And Ephesians 2.10 says we're created in, in Christ Jesus to do the works of God that he prepares for us to do. Our works, filthy rags, because they come from us. God's works, not filthy rags. No, not. And the only way we're going to ever be doing God's works is to die to ourselves. Because if we haven't died to ourselves, we're doing our works, not God's works. It's our church program. 
It's our plan to have a missionary sent to Africa, not God's. It's our plan. You know, when Jesus says, many will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, that's what he's talking about. You decided this, not me. This was your plan, not mine. You were supposed to die to yourself. You were supposed to lose your life that you might save it. You didn't want to lose it. You wanted to build it up with choices you make for yourself. And so people, when they're talking about this works issue, you know, especially in Calvinism, ooh, works righteousness, you know, they're completely oblivious to this fact about the Bible telling you that no, they're not your works if you have truly died with Christ. They're God's works. And that is how God is going to justify you. He is at work in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13 And that's a good thing because on Judgment Day every soul is going to be judged by works. Only those who do good will go away to eternal life. Those who do evil will suffer wrath. You can read about that at Romans 2. You can read about that in the sheep and goats judgment. It's actually all over the Bible. But people just ignore it. And play games and tell lies. It's not our works. See, what, what, what's going on is they think because you're doing them, they're your works. No, no, no. You're dead. If you're a true believer, you're dead. You have died with Christ. Do dead men do works, their own works? No. That's why Paul says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You can't boast about a thing if you're a true believer because you're dead. Those aren't your works. They're the works of God, which He prepares. Can't boast about that, can you? You ever see a dead man boast about what he's doing? Go out to the cemetery tonight and see if you see any braggarts out there. Coming out of their graves, bragging about what they're doing in their caskets. People are very confused here about, you know, these things. And these are some of the, you know, the three main things that they're confused about. It's just a mess. And a lot of people don't care about the truth. There's just that segment of the population that they just practice, you know, this what the world calls confirmation bias all the time. That's just who they are. They don't deal with facts objectively. They don't care. The only thing they care about is what they want. What they want to be true in this case. Not what is true. And so they don't really care about facts. They'll try to spin doctor things. Like, it's insane, really. You know, it's like trying to spin doctor 1 plus 1 equals 3 and then believe it. You're just deluding yourself by doing stuff like that. But they do it. A lot of people do it all the time. You know, some do it worse than others. It's it's crazy to watch. So you got these three things. People confusing salvation events. You know, they're having a debate and one person saying, no, we're saved by grace. And another person saying, no, you got to do good works. But he's talking about being saved on judgment day. And it's just a muddled mess of confusion because neither under one seems to catch what the problem is here. They're talking about two different things. Then you have this problem of misconstrued faith. People, you know, think they can cherry pick their own definition of faith. You know, it's like, I agree, one plus one equals two. I agree, Jesus is the Son of God. Hey, I'm going to heaven. I got my ticket. Something like that. I believe Jesus died for me. That's true. Yes, I believe that's true. I'm going to heaven. You're not going to heaven by what you think. Judgment Day isn't going to be a theology test where God goes, you know, I'm going to mark your theology here. You know, like a high school teacher marking an exam. Let's see, you got this one right, you believe that one, you believe that one, you believe that one. Yeah, good, you're in. Don't be so silly, man. It's not going to work that way. 
God is going to judge every man by works. And the Bible tells you what he's judging for. People like to play games with that one too. Oh, it's just for rewards or degrees of punishment. No, that's not what it says. Salvation events, number one, misconstrued faith, number two, and this messed up idea about the works. You can't do any works to have an Ephesians 2.8 event. Any kind. You can't do your own works to be saved on Judgment Day, but you die so that God does His works in you and through you to love God, to love neighbor, Works God prepares for you to do. Good thing. Because when God judges through Jesus Christ, he's going to say, yeah, that was my stuff you did there. That was my performance. You died. I see my performance, not yours. People are missing that. People are missing that when this works question comes up. And I think a lot of it has to do that they don't really believe in the power of God. They don't really believe in the power of God to do this in their, within them. Paul says at Romans 8.13 to Christians, he says, If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, the misdeeds, you know, the works of the flesh, you will live. But if you don't, you will die. There's all kinds of passages, but people will ignore them because they love their doctrines more than the teachings of Jesus or the truth you might find in the scriptures. And when you see them do this, you know that they really, really don't care that much about the truth. They care more about their creedal idols. I think I'm going to leave it there. Um... One of the things I've been thinking about, you know, is how to present this, this stuff. And I've never tried to present this issue in this way before. So I'm going to be, you know, looking at how people comment on it. It's one thing to understand something. It's another thing to explain it to people and try to get past confusion and preconceptions and all that sort of stuff. I hope that helps some of you a lot. God bless you.